Welcome everyone, I'm Michelle Schumann, I'm the Artistic Director of the Austin Chamber Music Center and I'm here with Chamber Chat and I'm so happy to be here with Alan and Rachel from the Aeolus String Quartet. Welcome! Thanks hey, Michelle. Thank you. And we are calling them, they are in New York uh, right now, where you guys are, you're living uh, right now. That's correct, right? That's right. It's How true. is that? How are you enjoying that? <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're... I think we're bona fide New Yorkers at this point, only because I was just telling Alan on the way here, it's raining today in New York, and the entire subway station is just like flooded right now, and I was like, you know what, I know how to jump over the puddle at this point, <laughs> like I, I can actually clear it to the other side. A it's, a skill, uh, it's a skill you have to develop quickly. <laughs> yeah, well good, now you're official, so, that, so that's good, and we'll see, I guess you'll see how long you'll be in New York, because you could easily become lifers, or you could easily get a job somewhere, and it could, you could be taken away. Yeah, it's true. It's true. That's the uh, the big dilemma always. <laughs> yeah, lifers makes it sound pretty great. Yeah, yeah. I think we'd be happy to see some yeah. <laughs> And you were just at the Chamber Music America conference, right? That finished. That was this weekend, right? Yeah, yeah. it's maybe wrapping up as we speak. Right. So, so we're skipping out on it for all of you. Uh -oh. <laughs> oh, we want to be here so more. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's a big conference, and I know lots of things go along in it, so I'm sure you, sure you got to take part in a lot of things. Oh, yeah, yeah, it was nuts. It's like chamber music nucleus of the world yeah. like, for the weekend. Yeah. Um, but so many cool shows. We went to a show last night um, that was an amazing quartet, the aerial quartet, playing at Subculture um, at midnight. They did the gross of fugue, and it was just like, it's awesome. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> as I hardcore think, as it gets for Beethoven. Yeah, I think New York is probably the only place in the world where a show at... 11:30 p.m. That's all late Beethoven would yeah. be completely sold out, and it was. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> it was amazing. Yeah, and I sort of wish we could do stuff like that in Austin, and maybe it could happen. You know, maybe it's worth exploring. Yeah. Oh. But, but, our, but I know in Spain, a lot of the concerts start at 11 o'clock because that's... people will have their dinner, or or they'll have like a, a show will start at let's say 10 o'clock, and then they'll have intermission at 11:30, and then everyone goes out and eats. For like an hour and a half, and then they come back for the rest of the program. Yeah, so, that sounds so good. Yeah, let's bring it to Austin. <laughs> yeah, maybe when my baby's like twenty or something. <laughs> <laughs> I do will love it. <laughs> but I know. Let's bring you guys to Austin. <laughs> yes. So you guys are coming into town uh, next week, and we're really excited about this program. Um, I'm I'm really excited about uh, that you guys are doing the Schoenberg. The, um, the Transfigured Night. It is such an amazing work, and I wanted to start the interview out kind of talking about that, because I know that that's usually the one composer where people immediately have this sort of apprehension, and they're really kind of scared of, of Schoenberg, and I think we just need to really remind people that, A, this is such an early work for Schoenberg. It's not even 20th century music. It was written in 1899, and it is so miraculously beautiful. I mean, it's just a gorgeous work, and I was just wondering if you guys could talk a little bit more about that in your experience with peace and how you're enjoying kind of digging into it. Yeah, um, no, first off, we were so thrilled when you asked us to play that piece because it's one that we all love so much and um, perhaps because of the very phenomena you were just describing, it's not requested as often as it should be um, for such a great masterwork. Um, but really, I think it's one of the most um, expressive and emotional pieces in the repertoire, really. It sounds, to me, it sounds more like um, Richard Strauss or Mahler than, uh, than Alban Berg or Weber, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a really just like super Brahms, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I think about it that way too. It's sort of late, late Brahms, and through that work, you can really see how the lineage kind of progresses into that second Vini school. Right, you know? right. So, but it's really cool. We're going to be, the, the piece comes along with a poem, and you probably don't know this yet, but I am going to be projecting it while you guys are playing. Oh, that's cool. awesome. As I wanted, I also wanted to mention that the text, I feel like, adds so much to like the emotionally compelling yeah. aspect of music, because it is programmatic um, yeah. for, like, kind of, I mean, throughout the piece in a pretty direct and literal way, and I feel like knowing the text and the drama of the story that's unfolding adds, like, that much more. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Should we spoil it for people and talk a little bit about the poem? Oh, yeah, yeah sure. why not? I mean, we don't we're have to Google it anyway. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's just so, because, and I love the poem, and I love how it works in the music, too, because it is such a, like, uh, it's sort of this little tale that kind of unfolds, and it's this, 
it starts out with this sort of tortured feeling that this woman has because she's carrying a child that isn't her husband's. But then it ends with him having forgiveness for her in this sort of really like phenomenal way. And so I just, I love that experience. And I love that we can have that experience through music. Yeah. And it's really amazing how palpable it, that the feeling is in the piece. I mean, even without the text or without the story, you feel that unbelievable sense of forgiveness in the music. I mean, that that choice on his, uh, you know, on for her behalf uh, is just incredible, and you can really feel that in the piece. It's yeah. beautiful. Yeah, and I think just like general, even not knowing the story, but this sense of tension and release yeah. in, in that way is just, like Schoenberg just, it's amazing. Like totally nails it. It's like everything you want. <laughs> it's everything you want the music to do. Yeah. Well, and it's, I think so often people think about Schoenberg as being this sort of, you know, really sterile figure, really a harsh person. But within this work and within this poem and how he chooses to set this poem, I think it really sees us, it lets us see the human uh, in, in Schoenberg. Definitely. Yeah. Well, I'm excited and I hope a lot of people kind of come out and, and see that because I know it's just a yes. thrilling experience. And I think also that sense that sometimes when you are... Uh, faced with a piece of music that you are apprehensive about, if you have that experience where you're drawn into it, it, it's an even richer experience than if you come to a piece of music that you know that you're going to enjoy. And you do enjoy it. But to have that kind of like transformation of your own self through the listening, I'm, I'm excited for people to experience that for sure. Yeah, so are we. Yeah. Yeah, and the rest mm -hmm. of the program is fantastic as well. Of course, you're doing yeah. Haydn Opus 70. So tell us a little bit about Haydn. So um, the Haydn that we chose to play is the Opus 71 number two, and it's a fantastic piece. So the Haydn, I think I feel pretty um, confident in saying for myself, he's probably just straight up my favorite composer. His yeah. quartets are unbelievable. Yeah. Um, the yeah. most innovative works, really, um, you think about the kind of where he was historically and the um, kind of the massive, unbelievable strides he took in the um, expressive nature of his music in uh, in that time period. It's really amazing. And this quartet, the Opus 71 number 2, is no exception at all. It's really um, beginning to end just a lot of fun and a lot of really inventive uh, characters and sounds. Yeah. And piece. I think, like, keeping in mind, like, I guess this is one of the later end of the quartets, but he wrote 68 of them, and before he was, like, writing string quartets, like, they were not really big. symphonies, you know. Yeah. <laughs> no big not, deal. No, it's not 68, 68 easy. Um, but it's, like, string quartets sort of thing, like, all, all of this, yeah. like, music that, I mean, all the composers that followed in this tradition after him, I mean, really, it was Haydn who, who, made this like really the the form that it is today and it's cool to see i mean especially compared to like the early quartets like, like we had played um a couple of the opus 20s and to see how the form has changed by the time we get to like opus 71 um yeah it's it's interesting the development well, and because he really was this kind of bridge over the baroque period to to classical period right. classical and really into romanticism in a sense too because yeah. if you think about I mean, his early works, and I know his early piano works, they were written for harpsichord, and they are very Baroque in style. They're very minimal, they're very small, they're very gallant, you know, just this sort of very proper sense. And then as he brings in the classical style, and especially, I think, the emotionalism, that sort of sensitive style that was that was so important in classical music, he really opens the door for, for all of that. You know, I get into this kind of thing where whatever composer I'm working on or studying, I'm always, I always say, well, without that composer, you wouldn't have anything. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. I, was, I, oh, I get yeah. caught on that, especially with Beethoven. It's like, if it weren't for Beethoven, we, our world would not be the way it is now. No, but then you can true. really say that for, for Haydn as well. Oh, definitely. <laughs> without <laughs> Haydn, Beethoven couldn't have been who Beethoven Yeah, was. exactly. Um, I think that's a really exciting <laughs> thing about this program, too. I always love when we have the opportunity to pair um, Haydn and Beethoven because so many of the things that we um, ascribe to Beethoven as being a, a lot of his great innovations, you end up actually hearing in the Haydn Quartets uh, 50 years earlier. And uh, it's pretty incredible uh, 
how I think maybe it's just because of the bulk of his work that somehow this it seems a little contrary, but perhaps people kind of overlook it. No way they're good because he wrote 70 of them in right. 70 yeah. years. Right. Um, but they really do have the same level of um, care. As, and innovation. Yeah. And I mean, just like the creativity within the classical form. Well, and I think maybe the prolific nature of it comes from the fact that he had cushy jobs. Yeah. So <laughs> Haydn didn't have to worry about how he was going to make a buck. He had great jobs. And so all he had to do was just work and like put out more and more music and if mm -hmm. you think about other composers who might be a little I mean you can't you can't call Beethoven less prolific but okay so he only wrote nine symphonies yeah <laughs> come on only 16 string quartets yeah. and so they were all they were all just kind of little, little pieces well, so it's stupid to, to, to say that in a way however you know the demands on Beethoven's life just in his personal life and in just like surviving as a composer were a lot different than with with Haydn. No, it's very true. Um, I think, you know, of course, part of Haydn's cushy job was having an orchestra at his disposal <laughs> also, right. and a string quartet basically in-house that he could, uh, I mean, essentially experiment yeah. with. Yeah. He just, you know, every uh, every couple weeks said, oh, I've got a new quartet for you guys to play, and he would just try new things, and that was a luxury that maybe no other composer has right. had um, in, in terms of the string quartet yeah. uh, genre, at least, so yeah. it's pretty amazing. And Haydn was lucky because I think that his patrons allowed him to do, you know, what he wanted to do. They wanted to have big works, and they wanted to have chamber works, and he was able to kind of work that out in that sense, but of course, the reason why that changed was because composers didn't want to be told what to do at all. Right. <laughs> um, which was which a real that's thing we can thank Beethoven for. <laughs> Absolutely. And yeah, he changed. He really changed that paradigm in a way. And because of that, nobody could tell Beethoven how to write. He had his great friends who gave him piles of cash to do things, but they believed in him, yeah. and that was really, you know, a huge thing. So let's let's talk about Beethoven Opus 130 then. Yes. Yeah, actually what you just said ties into the Beethoven, uh, the Opus 130 really of nicely. Of course it does. Um, Everything I say is always a natural segue. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't accidental at all. <laughs> no, <laughs> the, um, the, uh, so the Opus 130 was actually written originally um, with this massive finale that Rachel we Rachel mentioned we heard last night, the Gersa Fugue, um, which is this really unbelievably complex piece. Um, I think uh, Stravinsky uh, was known to have said that it was music that will retain uh, will remain contemporary for all time. And it's very, very true. You can hear that so clearly in the piece that I mean, to us, af even after, you know, Elliot Carter and Milton Babbitt, it still kind of sounds like new music. Yeah. Um, and actually due to demands from his uh, publishers, I believe, he ended up uh, removing the Gersa Fugue from the Opus 130 and writing a new finale for the piece, um, which we'll actually be performing it with the new finale, the new finale, <laughs> <laughs> um, in our concert just, in Austin. Is this the premiere then of that? No, I'm just Yeah, I yes. think so. I think <laughs> so. Never before heard. Yeah. And then when we come back for the midnight concert, we'll do the Gris Fugue. Sweet. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Very nice. Very nice. But it, um, it's the new version or the, the revised version that is mostly done, right? It's pretty, is it pretty rare that, that string quartets take on the, the Gris Fugue in that context? Or what would you say about that? You know, I think that I was um, I was talking to a member of the Juilliard Quartet about that recently, and they said that it wasn't really until the last uh, 40, 30, 40 years maybe that people did start performing the Opus 130 with the Gersa Fugue. Um, I think now it's probably become about a 50-50 thing. There are people yeah. that think the Gersa Fugue is, you know, that's what he initially wanted, right. so that's the right way, but right. he obviously um, had a, even though it was maybe under, uh, he was a little coerced to write the new finale, it's definitely as um, valid and kind of integral. Yeah, for and look... Beethoven didn't do anything that he didn't want to do. So even if the publisher suggested 
obviously he came to terms with that and believed in it because that that dude i mean you said course but probably that's even too strong of a word you know yeah, someone had yeah. a suggestion and and he probably thought about it maybe that's a good, that's probably a really good idea <laughs> yeah so. yeah basically that's what he wants yeah that's right. but i think yeah. even even with the grosser few kind of being separated from the rest of Opus 130. Um, I don't think it's received really less performance, probably. I, I mean, since at least the 20th century, because uh, it can kind of also stand alone um, as a piece. And actually, it's published separately in the latest, The Henley or the Baron Writer, um, that, that we're playing off now. And I think just because it so unbalances the rest of Opus 130, um, I mean, I don't even, it's 20 minutes or probably. something. It's just this huge, this huge addition to the end of the, the previous five movements. And the first movement is kind of long, but the other ones are much more concise. And I think because it so heavily weights it to the end that it can also stand alone in other programs. So now that groups are kind of putting it back with 130, mm -hmm. it's just a different way to kind of experience that whole although it has been experienced since. <laughs> you know, Beethoven also, he himself, he composed a forehand version for piano of the Grosser Flute that I played, and I actually coached it with Bobby Mann at Tanglewood. Oh, wow. Uh, a long wow. time ago, which was oh my such, gosh. It's That's really an amazing experience. And, oh my, but true. it is such a a cluster you-know-what on the piano. You can imagine the <laughs> yeah. just sort of like all over the place. It's pretty oh, yeah. Nice. I think that means you're doing it right. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And then, of course, the the emotional kind of impact of Opus 130 and the kind of journey we go through. Talk to me a little bit about what that's like as a quartet, kind of experiencing that and, um, and making that kind of exist in the music. I think... Um, particularly for a young quartet who's approaching late Beethoven. I mean, we've played a couple of the other late quartets, but there's definitely some aura about like late Beethoven. And so I think going into it, it's like this tremendous undertaking. We have huge reverence, like, I mean, almost to the point of like, it's untouchable. And there, a mentor of ours had said, you know, I mean, you just, you have to play it at some point. So you might just, you need to like learn it now and understand that it's a journey that you'll be going on. Like, Live your it. Time yep. period. Yeah. And so, of course, we, we approach it with a lot of trepidation, but um, as we're delving into it, I mean, when you're really, like, in that process is when you understand why it, it's so revered. And I think it's it's been really special to be able to, like, kind of tear it apart and really confusing to, like, try to put it back together. Um, but but it's amazing. And <laughs> we're very lucky because the Opus 130, of course, contains the Cavatina, which is... Perhaps the most beautiful piece of music ever written, so... Um. Yeah, I, I could uh, second that. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Well, we, we can't wait for the program. I mean, I, I just think it's going to be miraculous. And I think with, with the Schoenberg and the Haydn and the Beethoven, we, with all three pieces, we get this sense of going from dark, uh, passing from dark and going into light. And, and I love that idea and that sort of theme uh, that can be kind of pervade throughout. Right. So this will be tons of fun. <laughs> I yeah. can't wait to see you guys. It's been a while since you've been in Austin, or uh, at least with great. ACFC, right? So um, I know that all your fans are going to come out and see you, and we're just going to have a blast. I can't wait. Yeah. <laughs> we can't wait, too. All yeah, right. Thrilled to be coming back. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you for meeting me with me this afternoon. We will see you very soon, and um, and have, a, have safe travels as you come, and we will have a great time while you're here. Oh. Thanks so much, Thanks, Michelle. Michelle. Right. Bye. Bye. Bye.